Um, my name is Simon Davis. I'm a consultant ethicist uh, from York, and uh, like Greg, my disclosure for this talk is I'm a, a paid consultant for Edward Life Sciences. I've worked with them for a number of years now, and more recently with, uh, with Thomas Shireen looking at this new predictive algorithms. I'm going to look at a couple of things, uh, very briefly. But first of all, look at the burden of hypotension. What does it mean? What effects does it have on patients? Look at some new predictive technology that can predict hypertension before it happens. Greg showed us that using things like cerebral oximetry, you could define the lower limits of cerebral circulation, of, of blood flow, and you make for a really happy brain. In the UK, I'm not sure what it's like here, oximetry is the preserve of cardiac anesthesia and to some degree pediatrics. I don't use it in my practice, which is colorectal and vascular. Um, so I've had very little exposure to it, and I can't use it to define that lower limit. We don't have access. But Greg's lecture is food for thought. Perhaps we can. We showed some global improvements, not just in cerebral outcomes, but also in kidney outcomes too. But if by some luck the NHS could afford it, and I got given it, I'd have to remind myself there are other organs apart from the brain, and they get injured a lot more frequently. I was very fortunate a number of years ago with my colleague Dave Yates to set up the Perioperative Medicine Service uh, in York, and as part of that, we see all our patients who've had major surgery for at least five days following their operation. And what I see is kidney injury, I see gut failure, so nausea and vomiting or ileus, and I see infections. I don't see poor cerebral outcomes very often, certainly not strokes. I mean, post-operative delirium, yes, but we measure it very badly. And I think the reason we don't see it is the brain is the last organ to become unhappy. As your blood pressure decreases, cerebral blood flow is preserved until the very last. It has to be. We are biological organisms designed to survive. That's what it has to do. And just because the brain is well perfused doesn't mean your kidneys are perfused, and it doesn't mean your gut's perfused either, particularly in terms of your microcirculation. Uh, Greg showed us this. So if we can use cerebral symmetry to define the lower limits of cerebral autoregulation, that is a safe zone for the brain, and it applies to the brain only. So if we find the limits of 55, and about a quarter of people from, uh, from the paper Greg mentioned have a threshold below this, where cerebral blood flow is okay, it's adequate. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't assume that the organs in our body, the kidney, the liver, the gut, have the same threshold. So how do we know then what perfusion the brain, kidneys, and guts need. We don't. We don't have access to cerebral oximetry for all our patients, and we don't have methods to measure perfusion in the kidney or the gut that currently have clinical utility. There are experimental versions, mostly for research, but they haven't translated into clinical practice. And as Greg was alluding to, we have to look at the available evidence and this is population epidemiology, to try and tease out what the best or least worst blood pressure we should be aiming for. So what thresholds of hypertension are associated with harm? And I'll show you some different papers compared to uh, Greg. The really important thing is these are retrospective studies. They are observational. They show association and they do not show causality, but I will qualify that a bit later on. This is from Michael Walsh. 30,000 patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. That, that's my interest. And all they did was look at the time that mean arterial pressure was below various thresholds. The steep line that you see on both those graphs is a mean arterial pressure of less than 55 millimeters of mercury. And it's associated with an increase in both those injuries. And a very consistent message, the lower the blood pressure, the longer you're hypertensive, the worse the outcome that we see. And so for acute injury, kill, acute kidney injury, after 40 minutes, your risk is doubled. After 80 minutes, your risk is tripled. Before I get on, just note the line below, a blood pressure of 60 to 65. Not quite significant, but a trend towards harm there too. And that becomes important a bit later on. So at 40 minutes, risk is doubled. But even the worst of us, and there are some bad ones out there, and I'll show you that data a bit later, don't allow our pressure to be less than that for 40 minutes. But it doesn't really matter, because there appears to be really no safe duration at which your arterial pressure can be less than 55 millimeters of mercury. Even a short period of time is associated with the increase of renal and cardiac injury. And what's really important to remember, when we talk about duration of hypotension, it is the cumulative duration within an operation. It's not one five-minute episode, it's five one-minute episodes. That's your cumulative time 
Okay, so frequent small amounts of hypotension add up to harm. Whilst the confidence intervals overlap on this, once again, it's the same kind of message. The lower the blood pressure, the longer you're hypertensive, the higher the risk of injury. And so a prolonged time below 55, that's greater than 20 minutes, is associated also with the worst day-to-day -day outcome as well. And that's about 4% of patients, so not insignificant. The one or the paper that people always talk about is the one from the Cleveland Clinic, and the Cleveland uh, group have done most of the work on hypertension at the moment. And this is probably the biggest trial that we see. Again, observational, okay, so association, not causality, but 60,000 patients. And what they found was that at a flexion point of either 65 millimeters of mercury or a 20% drop from your baseline. Now, what baseline map is, we could discuss that all day long, and, and that's why we've gone for the figure of 65. But at this inflection point, your risk of both kidney and cardiac injury also increased as well. So they took this figure, this magic figure of 65, and they applied different quartiles of time spent below it. And if your blood pressure was less than 65 for a cumulative duration, of 13 minutes or more, okay? So this could be 13 one minute episodes, or it could be two seven and a half minute episodes. Well, that's bad maths, six and a half. Um, then that's when your risk started to increase. And what's interesting in this paper is that a third of the hypotension was between induction of anesthesia and knife to skin. That's anesthetic hypotension. That is down to us, okay? We have to take responsibility for that. It's a really interesting paper because it sets the bar much, much higher than the previous papers. But when we go back and we look at those previous papers, there were these hints of harm at these higher thresholds, but for longer durations. And this is the first, um, the first paper that's had the, uh, the sample size to do it. Uh, Andrew Shaw is about to publish something, the Optus trial at the moment, a really big data set, 300,000 patients, and exactly mimics these results. Lower and longer, it's worse for patients, and the threshold seems to be 65. This is an eye chart, you can't read it. Orange is bad, yellow is good. As you go across the top, those are the various organs that are injured. As you go down, that's the different thresholds of hypertension. The message really is, this is a systematic review of 100,000 patients, and it's that message, lower and longer is harmful. And the current evidence suggests it's around about 65 is our cutoff. So we know that hypertension is associated with harm. And the question is, well, does treating or avoiding hypertension makes things better? Or is, you know, is the group just self-selective? Do you get hypertensive and have worse outcomes because you're just sicker? And there is some evidence that treating hypertension is beneficial, coming from uh, Emmanuel Futier's group, published in JAMA uh, maybe a year or so now. And there's two groups. So the first group had their blood pressure optimized with peripheral noradrenaline or norepinephrine as it is over the pond. And the second group just had standard blood pressure management. What's really important to understand from this trial, and you'll find it in the appendix, this is not a trial of blood pressure management. This is a trial of fluid optimization versus blood pressure management. It's goal-directed hemodynamic therapy. Both groups were fluid optimized before they squeezed. So the tank was filled and then it was squeezed. But what they did show is a reduction in post-op organ complication or dysfunction from 51 down to 38%. That is a 20% relative risk reduction. That is pretty significant. Small trial, just 300 patients. We'll see large trials coming out in the future, but there's certainly a signal that treating hypertension or avoiding hypertension is beneficial to patients. So, Hypertension is bad. Treating hypertension may improve outcomes, but for hypertension to be a real problem, it has to be prevalence. Okay, now, the incidence of hypertension obviously depends on the definition. But if we just look at some of the common definitions, so let's talk a map of less than 40% from your baseline. Hands up if you think having a map that is half your baseline is good for you. And it pleases me to see no one's raised their hand. But, over 50% have this for one minute. And I can buy that. We're a bit heavy-handed with induction agents. Uh, a, a clamp comes off. Understandable. But four out of ten people have this threshold for five minutes. Okay, maybe we're a bit sluggish on the vasopressor. It takes a while for fluid to go in. I can almost buy that. But one in four patients has a blood pressure but throw this threshold for ten minutes or more. That simply is just untreated hypertension. We have allowed that to occur. Uh, let's look at a map below 55. There is no safe duration below this. We see not dissimilar figures. A third have it for a minute, 
15% have it for five minutes or more. And we look at Dan Sessler's work and try and correlate it to that, about a third of patients, and it turns out to be about 25% of patients, have a blood pressure below that magic figure of 13 minutes for uh, at 65. Okay. These are all thresholds and durations associated with harm. There is lots of it out there, and we can do better. But why is it so prevalent? And there are many reasons. There are all these different definitions. We didn't measure it very well in the first place. The fundamental problem with treating hypertension is that we treat it. Okay, we allow it to happen before it occurs. This state of reactive medicine. Hypertension happens. At some point afterwards, we treat it. In the interim, it's occurred. And remember, it's the cumulative duration of hypertension that's important. Okay, so these small episodes add up. And we can see this. This is from our Necafema trials. Um, this guy has a clear sight cuff on. The anesthetist just has a normal um, uh, oscillometric. Uh, measurements. And what you can see is a very standard picture. Hypertension occurs, we detect it, we treat it, it resolves. At some point in the future it occurs again and we treat it and we cycle and seesaw between hypo, normal tension and hypertension. But the cumulative duration is large in this group. But hypertension doesn't just occur, okay? except for surgical causes when a clamp comes off or a finger goes in the spleen. There is a, a process of biological instability that precedes the events. We just can't detect it with our standard monitoring. If we could, we could move to this proactive state where we treat the underlying instability that will lead to hypertension before it actually occurs. And we can do that now um, using predictive analytics. And we use the arterial waveform signal to do this. Why the arterial waveform? Well, obviously it measures blood pressure, but there are many other things that it measures as well. If we look at systolic rise time, we can measure contractility, uh, systolic decay time, looks at compliance. There are all sorts of different things that we can measure. And you can extract round about 160 different features from the arterial waveform, of which none of them relate to impending hypotension. These are all static measurements at a single point in time. But when you start looking at how they interact, that's when the information starts to become useful. And we can look at variability of these signals. So my heart rate at the moment is about 70 or so, but it's not 70. It's 70 one second, it's 68 the next, and it's 72. We have natural biological variability in almost all our biological parameters. And as we become unwell, we lose that variability. And we can measure and quantify that. Uh, we can look at complexity of the arterial waveform signal, and we see this all the time. Sick patients have a very sort of featureless waveform, whereas fit, healthy patients have a nice feature within it. And you can quantify that complexity and the frequency distribution using entropy. And we can look at how all these work together. Once we do that, we have some 3,000 features from each arterial waveform. Now, in terms of developing the algorithm, what was done then is you, you do a simple rock analysis. You pick out the most predictive, and then you look at what's called combinatorial factors. Okay, you take those predictive features, and you multiply them together at various powers from minus 2 to plus 2. And that then helps you assess the nonlinearity. And then you shove it into the black box, which is machine learning, and you come out with about 23 features that predict hypotension before it occurs. And there's a very good um, validation paper in uh, anesthesiology by um, Faras Atib, who's director of algorithms at Edwards. What you end up with is a number, and that's HPI there. You also get some additional parameters as well. We won't go into those today. Maybe we can talk about them in the discussion later on, um, looking at measures of contractility peripherally and also whether you're pressure responsive, that's EA dyne. But it's a number, HPI, that relates to an event. So the offense currently is defined, it's fixed. It's mean arterial pressure are less than 65 for more than one minute. The higher the number, the more likely you are to be hypotensive, it occurs in a short duration. The lower the number, the less likely you are to be hypotensive. And if it does occur, it will be much, much further forward in the future. And so this is data that Thomas and I pulled together uh, last year. Uh, Thomas is professor of anesthesia at, at Groningen uh, in the Netherlands, although he's naturally German and not Dutch, so we like him better. But this is HPI here. So if HPI is low, if it's in the 20s to 29s, the event rate and the event is hypertension. It's only about 30%. On the face of it, it sounds bad. But as you approach hypertension, that number will go up. And the average time is around about eight minutes or so. Whereas HPI is raised, almost everyone will become hypertensive, <coughs> and the time to hypertension is quite short. The duration has come down. What does it mean? 
Here's a patient having an anterior section. Uh, the black line is HPI. The red line is the mean arterial pressure. So HPI breaches the threshold of 85, um, around about this point here. And we don't see hypertension for seven more minutes. And the whole premise and the point of this technology is that in that period, you can intervene to treat the underlying cause of that instability and avoid hypertension and hence avoid it. And hence avoid those small cumulative durations that add up to patient harm. Does it really work? Well, well Thomas and I um, looked at some patients, 255 patients, all having major abdominal surgery. And overall, there was around about a quarter of a million data points looking at hypertension. It's a bootstrap analysis to account for within patient variability or repeated measurements within patients. And there's 2,000 iterations into the analysis. I've not shown you the point estimates. Uh, it makes for very messy slides, but they're all within 0 0.01 um, of the figures I'm showing you. So here's HPI. Uh, areas under the curve for predicting hypertension, 0.926 at five minutes and drops down slightly to 0.879 at 15 minutes. And that's true with all predictive algorithms. The further away from the event you are, the less predictive they are as well. Or always the analogy is looking out the window in the morning. If it's sunny, you know you don't need an umbrella. But you're not quite sure whether you need an umbrella later on that afternoon. So the further away you are from events, the less predictive all algorithms are. But for HPI to be useful, it has to have incremental value over what we currently measure. And we compare it to delta changes in MAP. So a delta change in MAP is we've taken this one over three minutes. You go back five minutes from the events, look at the MAP change over the previous three minutes. Changes in your blood pressure do not predict impending hypertension. You may as well flip a coin. Doesn't matter whether you break it down to different MAP thresholds, because as you approach hypertension, maybe those changes are a bit more important. Maybe they're more sensitive, but they're not. Changes in mean arterial pressure are not predictive of hypertension in a clinically useful period moving forward. And when we look at other factors as well, or other parameters, be it stroke volume, pulse pressure variation, cardiac output, nothing predicts impending hypertension better than the algorithm. And there's a very simple reason for it. These are all single figures or single parameters, whereas HPI is multi-parametric. Those 23 variables that predict hypertension are mostly combinations of different physiological variables. So it makes sense that it predicts it better. There's more information within that algorithm. And that's kind of cool. But going back to what Greg said before, there's a fundamental problem with all the data that we've seen. Okay, this threshold of 65 millimeters of mercury, yes, we can now predict it, but this is population data. And you and I don't treat populations, we treat individuals. But it's all we have at the moment. And despite the limitations, there are many, and the most of it is the evidence shows association and not causality. You know, what do we do? Well, what do we know at present? We know there is an association with kidney injury and MINS. The evidence, albeit retrospective, is consistent. Lower, longer, the more harm there is. There's now, with the Optus trial, over 400,000 patients in this retrospective database. And we have a small trial from Manuel Futier that moving forward shows benefit. The definitive RCT is years away. And what we have to do is ask ourselves, what do we do now? Do we just sit and wait? Or do we use the evidence we have in front of us? We fundamentally know that hypertension is bad. What we do in the present, I think, is accept that the map should be over 65, and we should avoid hypertension below this level. And this is an improvement in care. It may not be individualized, but just raising the standards so that our patients are not hypotensive is an improvement in the quality of care that we give patients. But it's imperfectly perfect. 65 for all, as Greg alluded to, is not ideal. It just represents the limit of our knowledge and the limit of our technology at the moment to measure organ perfusion. Population figures such as MAP of 65 should represent the starting point of our therapeutic limits, which we then titrate to the individual. Some will require a higher pressure, some will be okay at a lower pressure. And summed up nicely in this, um, this paper, it relates to septic shock, but I think it's quite translatable, in that MAP should not be used as a surrogate of organ perfusion on its own. You know, don't forget flow. Don't you know, use our brains in terms of teaching or treating patients. And ideally, 65 is our starting point. A map should be titrated up or down based on measures of organ function and tissue perfusion. But what are those measures? We don't have them. In the ICU, you can look at long-term renal function, but it's too late then. The damage has been done. 
you can measure mins, but it's too late. The damage has been done. We don't have anything we can use in real time. The stuff we have at the moment, the horse has already bolted. And perhaps you've got serial oximetry is the first step into this. And combining information about real-time measurements of flow and pressure in the brain into our predictive technology. You know, where are we now? At the moment, we have population targets, both in terms of map and human dynamics. We feed this into our predictive technology, and we get an output. We have a treatment so we can avoid hypotension. But moving forward, we need personalized targets. Cerebral oximetry is probably the first one of these. We can slave this into our algorithms, but there's other things we need to start looking at. There's real interest in real biomarkers at the moment. You can measure in real time things such as NGAL or the ancient like um, binding proteins that measure ischemic load in the kidney. This can be fed into algorithms. We can look at peripheral oximetry. And we can look at hepatosplanknate blood flow as well and microcirculation. And algorithms just take information. They process them and they analyze them. And if we do this, what we can start doing is getting adaptive algorithms where they can define the limits of water regulation, not just for the brain, not just for the kidney, but for the body, for the human, for the patient as a whole. And these algorithms can adapt. We've trained algorithms to predict blood pressures of 65. We can train them to predict 70. 75. We can train them to predict the lower limits of water regulation. It's just about gathering the data so the algorithm or the data can be analyzed by machine learning to give the output that we want. So I hope what I've shown you is that hypertension is both prevalent and harmful, and we can use predictive technologies to do that, minimize the hypertensive loads. We are limited by population epidemiology at the moment, but that will change. And the wide range and auto regulatory threshold that Greg showed us about means we have to move our technology forward into these adaptive algorithms that pulls in information from different organ systems. We're just not quite there yet. But that technology is developing, and machine learning will be the future. Thank you very much for your time.